Good day, everyone. This is Dr. David Phelps of the Freedom Founders Mastermind Community and Dentist Freedom Blueprint Podcast. Today, I am very excited to have our guest on. She's uh, somebody that I think most people in the industry know who she is, but a few of you may not, so this will be fun. It's Dr. Gina Dorfman. Gina, so glad to have you on today. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, just a little bit of background. Uh, Dr. Gina Dorfman is a practicing dentist and the founder of Dentistry for Kids and Adults, a family practice located just a few miles north of Los Angeles. She's one of the co-founders of the paperless software Yappy. Dr. Gina also hosts her own dental podcast, Behind the Smiles, where she dives deep into the business side of dentistry. She's also a published author, has contributed to many dental publications throughout the years. Uh, she's a speaker. To learn more about her, some of the topics she talks about, speaks about, you can always find her at her primary website, which is ginadorfmandds.com. So with that introduction, I, I just got to go back and let's first talk about, Gina, how did... How did you find dentistry or how did dentistry find you? What was what was the, the, the process that got you into the world of dentistry? Uh, I am a, uh, I'm from Russia and I'm Jewish. And in my culture, uh, a fetus is not really considered viable until he or she graduates medical school or dental school or law school. So I really had uh, three choices here. And uh, I landed on dentistry by elimination. Mm. Um, I didn't feel like maybe my link, my English was good enough to be a trial attorney. And, you know, being a paperwork pusher didn't sound very fun. Um, and I, you know, medicine, I don't like giving people bad news. Um, so I figured, you know, dentistry is a good fit because I'm interested in the business side of things as well. And in dentistry, it's just easier to have your own practice than in medicine. And so um, here we are today. <laughs> so talk a little bit about um, your, your, your family of origin. Uh, you know, I, I know that there's this, as you said, the business side, the entrepreneurial side, uh, certainly you have the technical skills, the clinical skills to, to do the fine art of dentistry, which is what we typically go to school for. Uh, but what, what brings the other parts of you that makes you kind of Gina Dorfman? <laughs> So, um, well, first of all, again, I, I reference uh, being an immigrant from Russia, and I think that when you coming from a country where there is no private property, there is no private business, because I came from Soviet Russia, um, there is this itch to, to have something of your own, to build something. And I think it's just very much part of my personality. Um, but but the interest alone is not enough. Like you have to get the skills, the leadership skills. In dentistry, so many of us struggle with um, the, the with running a business. I mean, all we hear dentists saying is just like, I just got to do this for another 10, 15 yeah. years before I can finally hang up the handpiece. But it's not dentistry, it's the people that I have to manage and motivate. And I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to hold them accountable. Uh, I don't know how to delegate. It's just easier to do it myself. And so um, for me, I had to do quite a bit of uh, self-learning. I was actually planning, I went to USC for dental school and they have Marshall School of Business. And I was planning on um, doing a five-year program, which would give me the DDS and MBA at the same time. Um, but I kind of burned out, so I didn't do it. And recently I applied again to Marshall School of uh, Business and I got in, but because of this situation, I ended up um, postponing this. So maybe one day, but I've pretty much self-learned from various resources um, because that's, you know, for me, it's fun. That's the fun part of uh, running a business. So you, you mentioned, um, you know, the people part. And I know you're a big fan of Jim Collins. Uh, you know, Jim, among other things he says, he says, find the who and then the what. And we do it the other way around. You said, you know, as, as kind of controllers, because I think people who want to have their own business, in this case, uh, practice owners, you know, part of what we did it for was to have that independence, to, to be able to do our own thing and have something that, as you said, uh, is, is part of, uh, you know, the American lifestyle, you know, be your own boss or have your own thing. But we get these, these skills, these specialized skills, and we don't really learn anything else about people, leadership, communication, uh, the, the aspects of running a business, which today more than ever, uh, you've got to know how to run a business. And so all these skills are missing and it's head in the sand, kind of put your head down and we invest in lots of CE and we'll buy the technology and we think that's all cool and, we, and that we'll bring that back and that's gonna change the practice. Um, what happens? You know, I, call, I call it Monday morning syndrome. The doctor goes off to the great CE or learns this new procedure. And 
excited, 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 and comes back and kind of tosses it to the team. We're doing this now, right? And then what happens? Yeah, and the team and the team is like, you know, if we can just, you know, avoid any eye contact with him until Wednesday, it'll pass and we won't have to do this thing, whatever it is. And then and then that beautiful scanner is uh, is collecting dust or printer or whatever, you know, is collecting dust in a in a closet. Because, you know, it, we when we when we struggle financially in practices, we think more CE, more patients are going to fix all of these problems. But a lot of times the struggle, I mean, this is a great profession. You can have, I mean, there are lots of very successful, crazy successful offices. And a lot of times there are unsuccessful ones sitting right next door to them. And it seems like it's just pure luck that the other person is doing so well. But the reality is everything, and we blame the economy, the DSOs, the HMOs, but the reality is it's what happens within our four walls. And if we're not learning to run a business, then the business is running us and we're just firefighting all day long. All this stuff just lands at us and we have to deal with it. And we all wear like 50 different hats, right? Like we're the manager, we're the producer, we're the, uh, the, the firefighter. We answer all of the questions. It's amazing that some of us still have doors attached to our offices because there are staff members coming in, in and out, asking questions. How do I do this? Where do I put this? What do you want to do about this? And, and we answer questions all day until the decision fatigue kicks in. Gina, when, uh, when did you open your practice? Uh, you're, you're a very competitive area, obviously, Los Angeles area. Uh, what year did you open? I opened my first practice in 2002. And I started my second practice in 2006 or seven, I want to say. Um, I ended up selling the second practice 10 years later. It did great, uh, but it was, you know, it, I had to limit the number of things that I'm involved in because I really wanted to pursue my software company full time. So, so with your primary practice today, um, just give us an overview. Um, how many doctors and, and, and staff, what, what's, what's that look like? I, I love this practice. It's my baby. Um, the second practice I never really loved as much. It was like the second baby, I guess. But my first, this is my firstborn. Um, I have right now about 33 team members. Um, I have six doctors, three GPs, and three specialists. We do pedo, uh, we do um, endo, and uh, oral surgery in house. Um, we place implants. We do, I mean, pretty much where, you know, we can treat just about anything in-house we do refer out uh, for ortho and perio so pretty much pretty much full service which which is obviously today is a big plus because we've got this busy society people are just you know have no time and we can come and get everything done under under one one roof so to speak then it's 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 convenience factor plus you know having the the, the good service and systems which is critical to to have you know a you know a raving fan base are 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 now are you a specialist I'm not. I'm a GP. Um, I, at one point, I kind of fell in love with ortho, so I did a lot of uh, traditional orthodontics and Invisalign. Uh, but I, you know, I, again, I had to uh, limit the number of things that I'm involved in. So when you first started your practice, the first practice in 2002, um, tell me a little bit how how it grew. Were, were you were you the the only treating doctor for how long? And when did you start? How did the growth start to work the first few years? So uh, I was the only doctor for the first year. Um, I started the practice and I remember uh, choosing a location and I thought, originally I was going to do four operatories, but I ended up doing six. And I was, I remember telling my Henry Schein rep, like, you know, how am I going to make this is such a huge facility? How am I going to fill it with patients? And he just said, don't worry, filing a bankruptcy on four ops or six ops is pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's just probably not a great, but you don't take financial advice from a Henry no. Schein rep, right? So um, I started working. Um, I was, uh, I started part-time. I was full-time with a hygienist about six months later. Um, and I hired my first associate um, at about 12 months, um, partly because um, well, I needed help um, at this point, but also because I got pregnant at the time. And so I kind of needed that transition. Um, and this is where I've learned that when you hire an associate, you have to possibly sometimes step back. This is one of the reasons why associateships don't work out 
just one of the reasons is that there's not enough work for the associates and or the associate is only getting the crumbs and the owner is is cherry picking the cases that he or she wants to work on and for me i knew that if i really wanted a full-time associate i really had to scale down um, and so I use the time to work on my systems. I use the time to work on, on training my employees and really getting ready for me to take uh, some time away from the practice and the practice just, uh, you know, working on all cylinders at that time, which was very successful. Uh, when I came back, the practice generated enough new patients and enough work for me to pick up um, more shifts. and. So I did, and then my second associate came along with my second baby. Uh, well, actually, the second associate was an oral surgeon who is who's this Friday is going to be, unfortunately, his last week. I have um, his um, cousin is starting after him, but he's pretty much spent the last 18 years or 17 years working in my practice. Uh, but my second GP associate was my second pregnancy, and I did the exact same thing. I stepped back brought an associate full-time, um, gave him um, everything that he needed to be productive, um, worked on the systems, scaled the practice, um, and uh, and here we are. So it sounds like you have a formula there. Have a baby, grow the practice. Right. But uh, even if you can't have a baby for whatever reason, you, you still got to step back. That's my advice for anyone who wants to bring an associate on and have a successful relationship. Step one um, is, is scale yourself back so that you work on building the practice, building the team, uh, building your systems, and uh, your associate can be productive and happy that they ended up in your office and not somewhere else. So you, as you said earlier, this is such a big mindset shift from the way all of us were trained growing up. And I'm wondering, you know, that first year that you were in practice where you were the only doctor and you brought your hygienist on, um, I guess, part time at six months, and then your associate when you were pregnant, where, where, where did you decide that you really needed to continue to elevate your skills as a leader, as a more of a CEO, stepping back from the doing of the thing to more of creating the systems and the culture. What, did you did you know that going in that that was going to be your, your your pathway, or kind of what was what was your realization that okay, if I'm going to make this work and I'm going to have a family and scale this business so it's not all dependent upon me, where did that realization come, and and how and how so? Well, it was in stages. Like I said, I was always interested in learning to um, to become a business person. Um, but the, but, but then at some point I figured, you know what, no one else does it. Everyone runs a practice without any experience. I'll swing it. And so, and that's what we do as dentists. We graduate dental school where there's just no time to, to have any business courses. And, and for, you know, I remember being in dental school, that's not where my mind was. I yeah. was probably the only student who, you know, instead of geeking out on, on Krebs cycle, I would run uh, to the basement where they had dental huh. economics and I would read dental economics like from cover to cover. Um, never paid as much attention to reading Pathway of the Pulp as I was interested <laughs> in dental economics. But um, but it, this realization was always there, but I was really, it was really becoming obvious when I started to scale my team and I ran into the same problems that we all experience. That's, you know, uh, that's, that was the motivation for, you know, I was doing a lot of endo. I was doing a lot of clinical, um, crown lengthening, uh, ortho CEs, um, and that's great. You know, you need to be, you can't be just the filling and sealants dentist, um, that the dental school prepare us for. But that's what we do. We, we, we feel like that's going to overcome our business problems and it's not. And so um, I remember going to Kauai and I needed a book for the, for the flight. And so I figured I'll start with pretty much the Bible of, of uh, business, the uh, From Good to Great by Joe Collins. And uh, that was my first business book. And I've since, um, I usually read maybe a couple of business books a week. Um, sometimes I go back and reread the books that I particularly like. Um, I just got a chance to interview one of my favorite authors on my podcast, uh, Cameron Harold. Oh yeah. Uh, who wrote Double Double. Yeah. Uh, amazing book. I just interviewed Mike Michalowicz. I yeah. love everything he writes. Uh, so that part is going to drop probably in a couple of days. Uh, but that was my goal. I, I go on a hike or I go on a treadmill and I listen to audiobooks and, um, 
it it gives me such charge because but the thing is you can read the books or you can get certain takeaways and start implementing because if we we get excited but we don't implement really well and my team knows that i come to the office on monday we're going to be doing something like they they don't even try to avoid eye, con eye contact with me they that know it's happening that doesn't, work, that doesn't work in your world i can get that yeah, yeah you're not you're not gonna be part of gina's team if you are trying to play that game not, not gonna work uh, so 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 how did so you're you're involved in lots of things again that entrepreneurial spirit where you don't want to you never set your your sights on just you know being you know a great dentist that's what most people do you have always had your sights on I think um, I you know I call it evolving iterating um, expanding one skill set so you know you you've written books you speak uh, you're a software developer we'll talk a little bit about Yappy because uh, I want people to know about that but and then and 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 you've got a family. Um, You've got a, a dog, right? You got a dog also. Yeah, that's. I have right. two. You two you dogs. heard? Yes. Okay. And you've got um, got a pretty good sized practice. How do you split your time? The time efficiency. Most people, I don't think, have the the ability or the wherewithal to be in so many different places. How do you segregate your time, your headspace? Uh, what makes this work for you? This is a great question. So I've tried, and, and as you can imagine, I read pretty much every book on time management that, that uh, was ever written. And most time management techniques don't work. Uh, you can't manage time. You can't manage people. You can't manage time. Um, you can manage money, but the way we manage money is we make an investment into something, right? And then that investment uh, returns an interest. And then, so we can invest like $100 and uh, because of the interest that it earns, uh, years later, we can have maybe, you know, $2,000 from that 100. That's how we manage money. And that's kind of, um, and I didn't come up with this philosophy. I, I learned this from um, Rory Waden, who wrote the book, Multiply Time. Um, I think it's called Multiply Time. I might be a little hazy on the, on the title right now. Uh, but basically, he applies the same kind of, uh, same idea to time management. He says, if you invest your time into doing something, which is eliminating, automating, or delegating, then you will collect interest on that. And most of my colleagues, and I am, I am included here, it's very difficult to delegate, but we need to invest time into delegation process so that other people can help you build things. For example, um, if you if you spend two hours teaching your assistant how to do something that you don't need to be doing yourself, um, then now you saved maybe maybe it takes you 10 minutes a day to do this, but imagine not having to do this. Now, a lot of us would say, well, you know what, by the time you find the right person to delegate to, by the time you teach her how to do it, go through a learning process, fix the mistakes, it might as well do it myself. It's easy, it's fast to do it myself. And that's the trap that we fall in because we're spending the same amount of time doing the same repetitive thing every single day. And the truth is it might not even need to be done. Like, uh, for example, I just got um, recently and I was like, I can't believe I didn't do it before. My bookkeeper used to drive to the bank and make a deposit. Well, all the banks are closed. So I so we started using a mobile scanner uh, and I'm like, why didn't we do that before? That saves so much time. That's just a simple thing like that. And, you know, I wasn't making deposits myself before, but there are a lot of things that we as practice owners take on ourselves that we really shouldn't be doing. And so that's when people ask me like how do you do everything the secret is i only do a few things um i'm busy all the time like i'd be lying if i said that i have plenty of, of free time i don't right before we started i made uh, tomato soup and and cheese and grilled cheese sandwich lunch for my daughter who is um at, you know at home for school so um so obviously like there's a lot of juggling involved and to say that I never drop a plate or a ball, that would that wouldn't be fair either. I do. I've I've uh, I once forgot to pick up my son from school. I've missed some things. You know, I was away. Um, I've missed half of his soccer games. I don't now because he's playing soccer in our living room uh, on Zoom. <laughs> he's on the high school varsity soccer team, and then he's doing it from home. Um, but uh, I, you, you know, I I I would travel to speak somewhere. And um, I, I, you know, I'd miss that, but uh, 
but the reality is you get a lot of things on your plate. You have to delegate. We, we all do. And it doesn't matter whether you're running a software company and a dental office, or you're just a mom um, and, and, a, and a practice owner. We're all busy. I just have more people to help me. That's the only difference. So learning to, to delegate well is, as you said, a key. And yet, especially in the training that we've had uh, in being well, we have, we have to have, you know, almost near perfectionism. That's what we were taught in school. You know, you just, and, and so I think we carry that forward. And certainly when you're working on a person, a body, uh, you know, then we need to be very, very exacting and precise. But all these other functions that happen around us in the business aspect, um, it's okay to drop a plate here or there, right? I mean, that's, I think we have to give ourselves permission to do that. If we don't give ourselves permission to try something for fear that it won't work and oh my gosh, I'm a failure and I'll never try that again. It's like, like touching the stove, you know, I don't want to go back and do that again, right? Because that, that hurt. Well, maybe maybe there's a, there's another way to, 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 to resolve that issue, right? I mean, so, so do, do you have to do that in your own head? When you're working on a patient, yes, you've got Gina, the doctor, the, uh, the dentist, but when you're the business owner, is it a different mindset for you? Yes, absolutely. Because, and, and even with associates, you know, for, for a lot of dentists, it's very difficult to delegate to associates. I also have uh, three expanded functions assistants in my practice who can place fillings. And I know for a lot of, or, you know, do temporary crowns. A lot of dentists would say, I would never delegate a temporary crown. But the thing is, I've been delegating for so many years. They're better than me, way better. I have an, uh, um, uh, an expanded function assistant who's been with me since 2000. Uh, five, which is celebrating her 15th anniversary. She's been doing it for 15 years, multiple, multiple units a day. She's way better than me at this. Like I couldn't be, I wouldn't be able to take an x-ray right now, probably without a cone cut. Uh, well, I mean, I could probably with a ring holder, but then how do you position the ring? Holder? Like this is, I'm like thinking about it. That just gives me right. feels just, you know, so, so scary to have to do that on my own. Uh, but the reality is as a business person, first of all, we have to realize that done is better than perfect. We can obsess and work can take whatever time you give it, it'll fill the time. Like you can write an article and we write it and we write it and we write it and it will be, eventually it'll be a perfect article, but it'll be late for a for a publication, like you'll miss your deadline. So um, a lot of the things that we we delegate, uh, first of all, we need to delegate proper, properly. A lot of us don't know how to delegate well. Well, a lot of times we delegate like, okay, go tie your shoes, come back, I'll tell you the next step. That's not how you delegate. I was talking to Mike McCullowicz about this because one of his books that every dentist must read is Clockwork. Uh, we probably all read E-Myth by Mal Michael Gerber, which is great. Uh, clockwork is like, um, is like E-Myth on steroids. And it gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to actually do run a business as a business, how to take yourself out of the equation. You can stay in if you want to, but you still want your business team running on their own without asking you questions every time. So when I talked to Mike McCullowicz about this, he said, most people delegate tasks and it doesn't work. You should delegate outcomes, yes. not delegate tasks. And it makes perfect sense. Um, a friend of mine recently was telling a story on his podcast, um, Working Interferences. Um, you, you might know Josh Austin. He writes for Dental Economics. He was telling a story on his podcast uh, that he was placing a post and he used the last one. And he thought, if I tell them to, to, to order a post, they'll probably forget. They will not notice that they need a post. Um, they'll order the wrong post. Uh, and then I just know I'm going to be placing a post next time and I won't have it. So he went, he ordered it. He, he put a rush delivery on it. Um, it was delivered, placed on his desk. He opened the box, handed it to the assistant. He said, put it in the right place. And sure and behold, when he was placing the next post, no one could find the post. No one knew where she put it. And he was just like, what do I do? Like, I can't trust people to get anything done. And I asked Mike Michalowicz, I told him the story. I said, what do we do? And he said, you know, in this situation, the problem is he delegated a task, right. put the post in the right place. What he should have done is he should have delegated the outcome. I never want to be without a post. You're smart. This is what you're here for. I hired you to make sure that I have a full stock of everything. This is your job. Figure out how to do it. And of course, you can give ideas and you can teach them your ways of doing things. 
Uh, but it's critical that, that we give them responsibility for getting things done. Because if we just delegate tasks, they don't have responsibility. They don't own the job. They don't need to get it right because they know you got their back and it should be the other way around. And when we feel like people fail us, the reality is, is that it's on us. We didn't delegate correctly. We need to learn to delegate. And so very important, this, this, this one is from Tim Ferriss. Uh, the way that you delegate is you give them if this, then that. So in this post example, it'll be, and if they don't have this specific post, then you can order this one. Like you can give them specific directions, right? Um, Mike Michalowicz and Mark Costas like to take an iPhone and record themselves doing a task where you can do a screen grab and record yourself on a computer to teach someone how to do something. But the, the point is that while you're teaching them to do something, it's even more important for them to figure out their own way of doing things and own the task, own the outcome. That's critical. And if they fail, you can't just, you know, lose it. You can't fire them. I mean, if I, if every time I made a mistake, I fired myself, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would have been fired a long, long time ago. So obviously uh, you have to treat them the same way that you treat yourself, which is like, you know, this is how I would have done differently. And when people come to you for questions, don't answer the questions. It's the easiest thing to do, right? Instead, you ask them, what do you think needs to be done in this situation? And you'd be surprised how often they get it right. And when they get it right, first, they teach themselves that they're capable of doing this without coming to you. And also, they give you the confidence that they're capable of solving problems without coming to you every single time, right? That's how you break that vicious cycle of, of people coming uh, to you with questions. And it's important when it comes to delegation um, that you, um, you also create I'm suddenly losing my, my train of thought because I don't think I'm answering the question that you actually asked me. Um, you asked me. Um, no, no, you're, no, you're, you're, okay. you're good. I, I, I was just gonna, I was gonna say, if someone, someone go back and listen to those last three or four minutes uh, and encapsulate that and take that to heart and really think about what you said. And you gave such a great example about the post and, and, and how, you know, and how, how to look at it. You're hundred percent right because, because people, People don't want just jobs today. People want to be empowered to think on their own, to, as you said, to own it, to have areas of responsibility where that's their thing. And they want to feel like they're needed and feel like they are respected uh, and not just, you know, handed, as you said, just task or go do this or, or where you as the doctor are like the shell answer man, who will just, you know, open door, come in, ask me everything because, you know, it all starts and begins with me. Uh, this, is, this is how you build a culture. And people that, that want that are the ones that will stay with you for 15, 16 years. And those that are treated lesser, like it's just some of the suck spit or whatever, then they're not going to be with you very long because nobody aspires to do that. Nobody does, right? That's such a great point. That is an amazing point. Micromanagement leads to turnover. We hate losing employees. We hold on to terrible employees because we're worried that the replacement is going to be hard to find and she might be even worse or he might be even worse, right? So the problem is that we, we, we need to have confidence that our employees will do things right and we have to let them show us what they're capable of. Because if we micromanage, I had a discussion with someone online the other day where they were looking for a screen recording software to record um, an employee working from home. And I said, uh, who's going to watch this? He's like, oh, no, this is not to watch. This is for her to know that she's being watched. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, that's a horrible way for someone to work. Like, imagine someone is recording you while you perform dentistry. That's like, that's horrible. Who's going to want the first of all, any capable employee, any self starter, anyone who knows that they're motivated and, and, and capable of doing good work, they're not even going to take this job. So you're already limited uh, to a pool of uh, ineffective, inefficient um, uh, employees who don't have the confidence to do the work. And now you're even scaring them. And people, people want safety, people want to know that it's safe to uh, step up and make a mistake and, and fail. And that's how they learn. That's how we learned, right? We made a lot of mistakes and we learned from them. Exactly. Um, that's how I learned I'm not good at endo. <laughs> that's exactly how I learned it. You, did, you didn't read Pathways to the Pulp. You were reading Daily <laughs> Comics. That's why, Gina. I mean, come on. <laughs> Exactly. It's all about it's all about it's all about focus, you know. What, the, what you're passionate about, but no, but that's that's important. So, so I I, I want to get to Yappy because, again, you're obviously a person that you look at life uh, and business and dentistry as as how you can create efficiencies with systems and delegate empower people. So, 
give us just a little quick history of, about how Yappy came about, what problem obviously you were wanting to solve and, and then uh, tell, tell people a little bit about what it does if they're not familiar. Thank you so much. So when I started my practice, I, uh, I wanted to go paperless. That was important to me. I knew that um, being that uh, chartless, so the difference really quickly, the difference between chartless and paperless is that chartless is how we store information. We have, uh, you know, Dentrix Open Dental, we have the uh, digital chart and someone manually puts the information into that um, chart with the scanning, retyping the data. Um, so everything is done twice. Like the patient mm -hmm. is filling out the form and then the, the front office retypes the form and then scans it and shreds it while the patient is sitting there looking at their watch every couple of minutes, sighing loudly, like, okay, are we, you know, I'm, I was here early. Um, so, um, you know, and it's just an efficient access to information. Now with paperless, it's a workflow. So there's no paper stage with, with true paperless. Uh, so patients fill out forms online, for example, or on an iPad, and it seamlessly populates into your practice management software. So that's kind of the idea um, behind this. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna open a practice in a very competitive environment. I want to be efficient. This is how I can take some PPOs and, and still be productive and pay for this huge office. So that was the plan, never build a filing cabinet um, in my practice, but I found out that it really wasn't there. Like the technology was not available. So we were still scanning and shredding, you know, at some point, um, 80s cold and, you know, they, they wanted their Enron shredders back. So the, and then there were other inefficiencies, like I would bring the patient to the front, but I only had one front office employee who was on the phone. And this was so like, I wanted to do this perfect handoff that like Sandy Purdue teaches, right? Mm -hmm. But what I end up doing is I come to the front and then we both, patient and I wait for Patty to get, get off the phone. And Patty's uncomfortable rushing her conversation with a new patient, uh, you know, sitting like this with, with the phone um, at her shoulder, nodding at me, patient wants to leave. I start writing something on a sticky note and then she hands up the phone and I end up retelling everything I wrote. So. And I was thinking, I wish there was a good intra-office communication software that was integrated with my Dentrix. Um, and so I kept coming up with these ideas of what I wanted to do, how I would have the software that was e efficient. And I was telling this to my dad, who is a software engineer. At the time he was working for Toshiba um, as a um, um, systems analyst, not a systems analyst, uh, architect, sorry. Um, and uh, he, he was like, okay, you know, whatever. He, he would research something on Dental Town and then get back to me like, oh, here's a work about how you can do something in Dentrix. Mm -hmm. And so eventually he ended up calling me. He's like, okay, I'm gonna retire from Toshiba. I'm, I'm done, but I need a project. Like, what do you want? What do you wanna do? Tell me about it. And uh, a couple of days later, I saw the prototype of the very first Yappy. Um, he's, we've, uh, we've had a good run for 10 years with my dad being the uh, chief architect. And uh, we are now, we now have a huge, well, not a huge, but we compared to where we were even a year ago, we just hired um, a lot of people for development and we're really growing fast. Uh, it's just been an incredible ride. We've added a lot of new features like um, appointment reminders and uh, online review requests. Uh, we are rolling out um, online scheduling by the end of uh, January. Um, and we have some other cool projects in the in the pipeline. So very excited about that. This is like the second um, sort of rebirth of Yappy this year. That's that's really exciting. So you 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 found you you, you had a problem uh, in in the practice with uh, the flow, and you searched, and there weren't any really good workarounds uh, with the existing storage software. Um, so you found the who. In this case, it was your dad who had the. The architectural ability to actually come in and design something from the ground up so again it's you didn't have to know all that stuff yourself you just had to realize there's a problem to be solved here and you found a who which was right in your right in your, your back pocket almost <laughs> uh gina this is so good you know we only scratched the surface today um we could we could come back and and do some other because there's obviously a ton of other questions i'd love to ask you but i like to keep these uh, relatively tight so i, I just want to thank you for being here today uh your your um your energy level your inspiration uh, has got to be contagious to a lot of people. And that's what people like is to, to, to find out. And you're so authentic talking about, you know, things that, you know, have not worked in, in your life, uh, but that you just, you step back up and you figure out how can I make this work? How can I make this work for me? How can I make my business work for me and my family and what you love to do? And I think that's the key to, to life is, is never, never quit seeking to, to find the pathway 
to to living the, the, the best life you can live. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. Thank you for saying that. And I, I thank you for having me on the show. I had a lot of fun talking to you. And, and I feel like you you get everything I said, you were like right on it. You totally very like minded. I love that. It's perfect. All right, Gina. Take care. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you.